Welcome to Staples. Staples guy, I just got to town and I need a presentation printed for a big meeting tomorrow. Well, Staples... opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Radio on the Black Talk Radio Network, a program that seeks to educate, inform, and agitate on the issue of 21st century legalized slavery. Hosted by social activist and spoken word poet Max Parsons, with new abolitionist and actionist Johanna Nilaya and Black Talk Media Project founder Scotty Reed. On this program, we discuss recent news on legalized 21st century slavery and human trafficking, along with projects and people who help combat it. Today is the March 22nd broadcast of New Abolitionist Radio. We're 12 weeks deep into 2017, and as a nation, we have collectively fallen fallen into Alice's rabbit hole. On this day, in 1765, the Stamp Tax Act was passed, the first direct British tax on colonists. The colonists insisted that the act was unconstitutional, And they resorted to mob violence and riots to intimidate stamp collectors into resigning. On more than one occasion, stamp tax collectors were murdered outright. Their homes burned, businesses destroyed, and their possessions taken by mobs, including their slaves. Ten years later, colonists rose up in an open rebellion against the British, resulting in the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. It starts with this declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, It is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. If you're listening to New Abolitionist Radio, we've got a lot to say and little time to say it, so let's go. A rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad is 60-year-old former Navy sailor Keith Allen Howard, who was wrongfully convicted of a Newport News rape and murder back in 1983. He has been locked up for 33 years, at one point facing the death penalty. This week, after DNA evidence exonerated him, the Virginia Supreme Court threw out his conviction. Our abolitionist in profile will be the angry abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, December 10, 1805, May 24, 1879. A prominent American abolitionist, journalist, suffragist, and social reformer. Have a question or comment? Just call in toll free from the U.S. and Canada at 866-510-9025. You can chat with us and others by logging in at uberconference.com slash Black Talk Radio Network. Once again, I'm Max Parthas. What's happening, Brother Scotty? 
is Johanan with us this week too? Um, no, Johanan. You know Johanan and the way his job situation is. Hopefully, he'll join us later. But in terms of myself, I'm doing the best Don't I can. To hear you. I'm sorry, Max. I had myself muted. No, Johanna hasn't joined us yet, uh, but I'm doing the best I can behind these enemy lines. Uh, I recognize that my situation is a whole lot better than those who are find themselves on the modern day slave plantation or in the jails, uh, sitting there for a year or more without even so much as a conviction, innocent until proven guilty, but yet punished because they don't have enough money to bail themselves out. So um, I'm I'm ready to go, uh, brother. Um, we got some good news to report, along with the bad news that we have to report. But I'm really, really uh, liking the fact that <laughs> Sheriff Lee Baca, the former sheriff of the uh, country's largest jail, Los Angeles County Jail, uh, has been convicted on corruption charges. And, and now they're trying to play like, Oh, before we sentence him, let's get him tested for Alzheimer's or whatnot. You know what I'm saying? So, what? yeah, the conviction, though, he, he was convicted after the first trial ended in a mistrial. Um, on what you were reading, you know, uh, history is one of my favorite subjects, always has been since middle school. And just the hypocrisy of what you just read. Um, about mm -hmm. these people uh, talking about they don't want to be taxed and, and this, that. Now, remember, these ain't poor people now. These are people who have built their own little fiefdoms and kingdoms on the backs of people that they were enslaving. It is not unlike what we see today with billionaires and multimillionaires not wanting to pay their fair share of taxes. So what those colonists did, the Washingtons, the Jeffersons, the Franklins, and some of the lesser known ones, um, they were just tax exconders. They wanted the British to continue to pay for the protection they were receiving from the British soldiers from those whose land they were stealing. OK, and and so, you know, just the whole hypocrisy of that. But there was a solution also in what you read that I want to bring to people's attention that we have also found in many of these state constitutions. And that part where you talked about, uh, let me actually pull it up or if you have it up, Max, if you can. Uh, read that portion again about when governments become corrupt, the people can do what? says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. See, that's the solution right there, and you'll find similar language in state constitutions. The, the solution isn't to reform the Democratic Party or, or try to change the leadership from, from uh, what do they call them, neoliberals to progressives. The solution isn't for the Republican Party to be reformed and, and what have you. The solution isn't reforming slavery or anything like that under this current system. Uh, like you always say, the solution is abolition. So we need to, I mean, who thinks that we can reform this evil, corrupt beast? We need to do what the Constitution prescribed for a country that's still practicing slavery and engaging in human trafficking. That's just my thoughts on it, bro. You, you pointed out the right uh, hypocrisy, and there was more. Uh, if you notice the Stamp Tax Act rebellions, they went out and they rioted and they tore businesses down and they murdered people and they brutalized people and they ransacked their homes, even stealing their slaves, as I mentioned. You know, and these are the people we call the founding fathers. But when you see places like Baltimore or Ferguson, where people are standing up or in Charlotte, where they're standing up for their rights, suddenly these are bad people now. You know, so it's totally hypocritical. These are people standing up for their rights, rights in matters of life and death, where literally their lives are at threat. 
where they want to see this system abolished as well. But instead, you would rather see them go to prison and you'll arrest children and give them $500,000 bail for breaking a car window on a police car. The hypocrisy of problem, these... Go ahead, Max. I, I was just saying, I think that our problem is also described in the uh, Declaration of Independence, where it says people will uh, suffer these wrongs as long as it is uh, possible for them to suffer these wrongs before abolishing it. And we're so interconnected, this system, with the world stage that to take it out would cause ripples worldwide. You would see, like, huge corporations whose existence would be under threat, literally. So those powers that be do not want to see something like that occur, and they will fight to the death to prevent it. Right. And also, they will label those who quote these words found in their so-called most sacred documents, the the U.S. Constitution and the state constitutions, and they will label us as being seditious or whatnot for simply even talking about these solutions. But you know what? Like uh, Brother David Attendo's radio show says that and we should be preparing for these things so that we're never scared but always prepared. And that is what we need to be preparing for. Well, just a heads up for you, Scotty, and for our listeners. Usually we have the dual experience where you can find the links that we're talking about as we're speaking about them. But for some unknown reason today, uh, just in the past hour, I'm unable to access the new Abolitionist Radio Facebook page. So I won't be able to post anything. And without your hunting uh, being a part of it, we may not be able to provide you with those links during the show. But I'll get them to you as soon as possible. Max, something is going on on that social media uh, platform. But for those uh, who are members of BTR community, and I think also uh, when we post um, the stories in um, the planning group or in the group abolitionists, but on the planning page, that that's open for the public to see. So they don't have to have a membership to see that. So they can just go to btrcommunity.com. But something is going on with Facebook as um, uh, several of the page that that uh, we manage. It Sometimes it doesn't even pull up any of the posts. So that's something I've noticed over the last hour as I have been posting content to various social media networks. But that is why we established, one of the reasons we established btrcommunity.com because we know there are those who would like to censor uh, the content that that the grassroots tries to get out to the people. So again, all the links can be found at btrcommunity.com. Perfect. And you know, just while I was talking about it, I had been clicking refresh, 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 and it finally came back. So I, I may be able to go ahead and post the stories that we speak about them as well. But make sure you become a member of our community on Black Talk Radio Network as well, where we have more control over these things than Mark Zuckerberg. You know, we've been busy with videography and discussions like in the abolitionist movement. Like, we're hearing discussions all over the place, Scotty. Muhabdin Dibaha, which has been a regular visitor here on New Abolitionist Radio, one of our comrades, I've been working with him for years now, the leader of the Black Lives Matter movement in Charleston, South Carolina. He did a, a panel discussion on the school to prison pipeline with other ladies and gentlemen who are well versed on the subject. And he reached out to me about a week in advance, like, Max, can you hook me up with info so I can study on this school to prison pipeline? And it's about an hour-long discussion, but it is incredibly insightful and powerful, and he held it down on behalf of the abolitionists. Everybody at that table, literally, was an abolitionist, and was saying so specifically. And that's wonderful to see, where you're finally giving abolitionists a chance to discuss what they think, rather than just reformers talking about reform all the time. So I put that on the uh, site. Also, the video where I did the 13th Amendment discussion after viewing the film in South Carolina at the Majestic House, a historical house, that is also available. Shout out to Jazz Springer, who produced it, and I-5 The Heat. I'll be working with them over the coming months as well, doing other videos. Uh, I do need to make an apology about my particular part in that video. I tried something new, Scotty. 
you know, I had spent the whole damn day arguing with people who are supposed to be intelligent, but we're not listening to a single word that I was saying. They were just stuck on stupid at that point. So I went in with a chip on my shoulder. And I said, you know what, let me try to put some credibility to my words before I even speak to this crowd. And I did that. And I felt like a butthole for even doing something like that because the truth stands on its own. It don't need no credibility. It don't need nobody to, to, to put out accolades or say what they've done or anything like that in order for you to hear it as truth. So I, I want to apologize for that. It was something I wanted to try, and I'll never try it again. But that uh, filming, that uh, doc discussion is incredibly insightful, so it's available for you on New Abolitionist Radio to check it out. Well, Mash, let's uh, jump into our first story. And if you don't mind, I like to lead with uh, this former uh, plantation overseer, Lee Baca, being convicted on corruption charge, uh, obstruction charges of justice and other charges. All right, let's go with it, Scotty. Um, it may be a video here that I can play. Uh, give me just a moment as it loads up. As you know, sometimes, you know, they... They uh, hit you with the ad before the video, and I'm not complaining because it costs money to maintain these platforms and what have you. But uh, let me see if I can uh, get this video to play here. They were extraordinary. Okay, I made a mistake here. Come on, um, L.A. Times. Get back to work the next morning after spending close to midnight on. I want to thank my wife. Uh, she has such a great spirit of love. I want to thank my friends and supporters for all their diligence in helping me through this time in my life. I want to also say that I appreciate the jury system. However, I disagree with this particular person. Now, you've known me for a long time. I am a faith-based person. My mentality is always optimistic. He's a faith person. I'm sure he shares the faith of the founding fathers, quote unquote founding fathers, uh, the founding slavers. As I call, I recall many of them were so called faith based Christians too. Lee Baca, the once powerful and popular sheriff of Los Angeles County, was found guilty Wednesday of obstructing a federal investigation into abuses in county jails and lying to cover up the interference. The verdict, which jurors reached on their second full day of deliberations, marked a devastating fall for a man who, in his 15 years as sheriff, built himself into a national law enforcement figure known for, quote-unquote, progressive ideals on criminal justice issues. Baca, who is 74 and suffers from the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, now faces the likelihood of time in prison. Baca showed no emotion as the verdicts were read in a packed downtown courtroom. I disagree with this verdict, Baca told reporters afterward. My mentality is always optimistic and I look forward to winning on appeal. All right, so uh, it goes on to talk about that little press conference. Um, it, um, I'm going to go further down. Acting U.S. Attorney Sandra Brown said, this verdict sends a clear message that no one is above the law with a career law enforcement. With a career in law enforcement, he knew right from wrong, and he made a decision that was to commit a crime. And when the time came, he lied. He lied to cover up his tracks. To get to Baca, prosecutors methodically worked their way up the ranks of a group of sheriff's officials who were accused of conceiving and carrying out a scheme to impede the FBI jail inquiry. And all 10 people from low-level deputies to Baca and his former second-in-command have been convicted or pled guilty. Several other deputies have been found guilty of civil rights violations for beating inmates and visitors in the jails. That is a story coming to you from the LA Times. And um, uh, again, 
you know, now he's playing, now they playing like, oh, he got early Alzheimer's and so let's go, let's go easy on him. Let's not put him on a prison plantation like, you know, we've done millions of other people for victimless crimes. And, you know, with that said, um, there's another sheriff that I feel like should be investigated. I actually produced a report last week. He should be investigated, prosecuted, and convicted. And that is our favorite uh, proxy racist tool up there in Wisconsin, uh, David Clark Jr. Max? Um, First of all, as someone who suffers from Huntington's disease, I'm not trying to hear his excuse. You know, uh, Huntington's is very much similar to Alzheimer's, and I've been dealing with those processes myself. Uh, physically. So hopefully if they ever arrest my ass, I can use that as some kind of defense too. But uh, yeah, I'm not trying to hear that. Secondly, uh, I would like to start singing the na-na-na-na goodbye song, if at all possible, Uh, because he needs to go. As you read, they were abusing visitors. They had jailers abusing visitors. This dude was running his own little mini mafia inside this prison. He even at points had uh, prison laborers where they were chained together and working outside, if you remember. They also made the tent cities as well, where they had prisoners living in these inhumane conditions. And, you know, once you go into a prison, it doesn't matter if you're innocent or guilty. You're going to get treated like the worst of the worst. And this was one of those white supremacist types who saw us as people of color as less than human and treated us as such. So, uh, I hope he spends the rest of his life in prison, but I would assume he's probably not going to end up spending a day. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised either. Um, but I, I tell you, man, this just – people don't believe us when we talk about the conditions on the, in these jails and in these prisons. Any horrors that you can think of pre-1865 slavery that was going on, on Thomas Jefferson's plantation or George Washington's plantation. They're going on in these on these prison plantations with overseers and Christians like Lee Baca. Like Lee Baca. Man. Well, there you have it. Right here on New Abolitionist Radio on Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, the report on Lee Baca taking his happy ass to jail, hopefully. Hopefully. Anything else on that one, Scotty? Um, no. What did he say? <laughs> I said hopefully, no, no, uh, but I'm like you. I'm not hopefully. holding my breath. Right, right. Because, you know, unlike most of us, uh, he has access to lawyers and courts, and friends in high places. Right. Uh, so I, I don't expect a lot to come from this. Yeah, because he's good on paper, but that's it. Yeah, but he's like David Clark. He was a darling of the media. You'll see him on CNN, Fox News. And just justifying, you know, the prison uh, plantation here uh, in America. So, you know, what a steep fall. Uh, but this just gives gives us hope, though, you know, that we can take other ones down. But again, uh, as we talked about in the beginning of the program, the Constitution, including state constitutions, has the real solution, I feel. Um, yeah, because he's just one out of many across this nation that's engaged in these sort of activities. Max, we do have a call, uh, area code 305. Did you have a question or comment for us on New Abolitionist Radio? Thank you for calling in. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, George Milencroft calling. Um, oh, George, I'm... what's happening, bro? Hey, just, welcome, just welcome wanted back to, to the program. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to update you guys on what happened to the Darren Rainey case. Uh, For your listeners, uh, he was the the severely mentally ill African-American who was scalded to death by guards in the Dade uh, Correctional Institution where I worked in the psych ward. And... uh, Unfortunately, our local state attorney, Catherine Fernandez Rundle, is not moving ahead with charges against the guards that we know put him in the shower to die. For those that don't uh, recall this story, and and George, um, 
please again tell people about the book you worked inside of that prison at the time as a health mental health professional and you wrote a book documenting uh, what happened to Daryl Rainey. But for those that don't recall this, again, any of the horrors that you can think of that occurred on private prison plantations pre-1865, they put Daryl Rainey in a shower with scalding hot water to the point that his meat fell off his bones. George, what's the name of your book? And tell people how they can get it. Uh, the name of my book is called Getting Away with Murder. It's available anywhere on Amazon. And my website is called gettingawaywithmurder.org. So for people interested, they can go on and, and get deeper into this issue. Uh, but the murder of Darren Rainey is not just an isolated situation. Uh, there are a whole slew of unexplained deaths here in the Florida Department of Corrections and also nationwide. Uh, we unfortunately live in a culture of brutality and it's, it's exemplified by the behavior of a small minority of guards that are just out to make the lives of these inmates and patients, in the case of the psych ward I worked in, as miserable as possible. And, and so what happens is that these uh, mental health patients, like in my unit, were subjected to beatings, uh, starvation. Uh, there, was, there were rumors that they were doused with chemicals. I mean, you name it, these, these guards just, I think, spent a lot of their time just creating misery. And these, these are sadistic, sociopathic type of people who enjoy the suffering of other people. You know, something you George, said there, ahead, George, you said a small minority of guards. But that indicates to me then that the majority of guards weren't doing anything to stop these guys. And if you would, did the district attorney there or the state attorney there give a reason as to why she's not moving for forward on this case? Well, she gave a number of reasons. And what came out, the medical examiner did an autopsy on Darren Rainey, and the preliminary report said that there were visible tra uh, signs of trauma on Darren Rainey's body. Yet in the final report, the ME called Darren Rainey's death accidental and that, there were, that he suffered no burns on any part of his body. And we know from patients in the unit, one of the patients was given the job of cleaning up Darren Rainey's skin that had fallen off. 90% of his skin had come off of his body, and this inmate collected the skin in Darren Rainey's shoe and was directed by the correctional officer to throw it in the garbage. In other words... They cleaned up the crime scene. So mm -hmm. there wasn't a whole lot of evidence, but we also, she disregarded the testimony of the patients who were in the unit at the time of Darren Rainey's death. They described hearing him crying out, please let me out, please let me out, I won't do it no more. Um, and... You know, this this was just something that the state attorney decided that, that their testimony was not as strong as the guards. But here's the thing about I, I know about guards is they lie. They lie a lot on incident reports, and they lied when I was in there, and they couldn't be trusted. And the state attorney, I think, bought their story whole hog. And, and that was a, a, a huge problem. So she, she was looking for every reason not to move forward with charges against the officers that we know put him in that shower. And, and that was sort of the, 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 
that's it in a nutshell, really. Um, so it, it it left a yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I'm just in agreement with you. Go ahead and uh, continue speaking, George. Yeah, and for people who worked in the unit, the the, the state attorney didn't interview uh, hardly anybody, and she made it seem like it was just a swell place to work, and you know. Uh, nothing bad was happening there, but what she didn't get from the people that worked there is that it was a hostile, toxic working environment where guards intimidated mental health staffers to the point where I know of three women who were eyewitnesses to beatings and those beatings went unreported because they feared retaliation from the guards. And so this was a, a very uh, poor working environment that the state attorney never found out about. She didn't dig deep enough. You know, I, uh, for those that are just tuning in, George has been our guest before, and he was an eyewitness to much of what was going on in the prison itself as an employee in the psychiatric uh, ward there. Uh, he had seen uh, Darren Rainey uh, prior to these occurrences. And what he's talking about is a cover-up, a murder of this uh, mentally ill inmate in this uh, prison by the actions of Cornelius Thompson and Roland Clark. Uh, and during the period that Darren Rainey was killed at that time, there was another inmate who hung himself from an air conditioning unit, and he left a note sewn into his shorts that detailed the uh, abuses against inmates in the mental health unit. And for those that have been viewing the uh, Spike TV's Time, the Khalif Browder story, you'll see the correlations where, as he said, it's not happening just in Florida. The same thing is happening in Rikers Island, as well as other prisons across America. Uh, even at one point, just a couple of weeks ago, we had one of the Rikers Island's former guards come on and tell us about how she had been subject to physical abuse as a black woman working as, as a guard in these units. So even the guards who stand up are subject to being intimidated, if not abused. Yeah, that's a really good point. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a minority, a, me a malevolent minority of guards that, and, and administrators that basically control these prison systems through intimidation and, and brutality. And the good guards, they will not speak up out of fear of possibly having physical violence done to them. And so this is, this is the prevailing environment of our prison system and for the inmates that are that are in that environment, um, it's like shooting ducks in a barrel. I mean, they don't have a whole lot of power. And what we're seeing in Florida is a number of prison riots. And, you know, the Secretary of, of uh, Corrections here, her name is uh, Julie Jones. Whenever one of these prison riots happen, she goes on to say, oh, well, we don't have enough guards, we don't have enough funding, and, you know, we're, we're, making step, we're uh, taking steps to make things better, so on and so forth. She never mentions the culture of brutality and secrecy. George. And this is the environment that these inmates exist in, and it's an environment of disrespect. Now, these people that are, are, are brutal and violent, they try to control the prison population through force. And that never works. If you respect a man, that man will do things for you just because he feels like you're getting to know him. Uh, he's not just another number. When I... When I uh, ran my groups and did my individual therapy in the prison psych ward, I never treated any of the men with disrespect, and they treated me with respect. You, you give respect, you get respect, and that's what these violent guards and, uh, and, and uh, administrators don't get. 
George, let me ask you um, this. Um, yeah, um, isn't it true that there are, are – and I don't know if it's higher than the national average in other states, but didn't the state of Florida – had to post a, a website just for uh, family members to be able to track these deaths of their family members? Right. They added a new um, uh, thing to the website, to their existing website, about inmate deaths. And if you go on the Florida site, you can kind of navigate to it, and it breaks it down year by year. And when the Derek Rainey story came out th- that year, there were 347 deaths. The next year, there were even more. And the next year, even more. And, and people thought 347 was amazing, and then it got even worse. Yeah, we were uh, among the first to report on that website back here in 2014, I believe it was. Uh, Would you, as a matter of fact, tell the people about uh, how Florida had gotten to the point where they had to show how many people were dying in these prisons? And it was just beyond belief. And many of those deaths were listed as cause of death unknown. (laughs) So there really was no explanation. And I often say that any uh, time that you're put into a cell, it doesn't matter if it's a jail cell or prison cell, for whatever reason, is a potential death sentence. Just look at Darren Rainey, why he was in there. He was serving a two-year sentence for cocaine possession. So he probably had a little bit of crack on him, maybe 10 or 20 hours worth of crack on him, which got him two years. He spent four right. months only in this prison before he was dead. So this little $10, $20 crack vial cost him his life because of the way this justice system is set up and because of the way the prisons are able to uh, – act of their own accord in any way that they want uh, due to the power of the police and prison guards union. I have that's, another that's question. That's exactly right. And, and the, our criminal justice system criminalizes mental illness and addiction. We should be treating these things, not punishing people, not executing people by scalding them to death. Scotty, you had want to say something, brother? Yeah, I had a question. Um, Is there, well, we just heard Jeff Sessions, the new attorney general of the uh, Justice Department, state out front that, hey, we're not going to spend any more money investigating uh, these police officers on how to do their jobs. We're not going to uh, spend any money trying to tell them how they do, do their jobs. So to me, that sent a signal right then and there that, hey, these slave catchers, you you got a license to kill. We renewing your license. Do whatever you want to do. You don't have to worry about the Justice Department coming down on you. Now, this is statements that he made to attorney generals at a conference from all over the state. I mean, all over the country. And so my question to you is, um, had there been, prior to this new attorney general taking office, a federal investigation into the murder of da- Darren Rainey? Yes, it was announced. Uh, I, it's between, I, I bet it's about two and a half years now that they announced a criminal investigation into Darren Rainey's death. And I know for a fact that the FBI interviewed a former patient in that unit, his name is Harold Hempstead. Uh, he was the first one who tried to work to get Darren Rainey justice uh, from behind bars. And I was the second one. I heard about it two days after it happened. Uh, so the, the FBI, I believe, still has an open investigation, and, you know, that means the Justice Department as well. They're just moving very, very slowly, and it could be that they were waiting to see if our state attorney here, Kathleen Fernandez-Rundle, would pursue charges. And now that she hasn't pursued charges, maybe they'll kick it up a notch and uh, finish their investigation. I mean, there's always hope. But, you know, hearing Jeff Sessions 
make that announcement. Basically, he's saying that there there's no accountability. You know, if, if a police officer or a correctional officer kills somebody, well, we're just not going to investigate. I mean, that is that is absurd. I mean, that's his job. So I'm not getting that. Um, I'm with you on not getting that, at least when you think as a human being. But when you start thinking as a sociopathic, white racist supremacist who really doesn't have any value for not only black life, but any life that he seems that he sees as unworthy, when you start thinking in those terms, it starts to make sense with slavery and human trafficking, with uh, not wanting your army of armed people to come under investigation for any reason that would lead to a massive change in business as usual. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's going to be a lot of uh, blowback uh, from that because you can't just go out and make statements like that and not expect people to get up in arms uh, because every every week we see some um, police brutality, some story about police brutality, whether it's an outright outright killing or beating, and to to just blow these things off and not investigate. Um, that's as you said, is sending a message. Hey, it's open season. Yes, uh, as if it had ever stopped. That was what yeah. we were here for, is to try to make it stop, to bring an end to this. It never has ended at any point in American history. It's always been this brutal. But with the advent of cell phones, particularly the iPhone, since 2007, a window has opened into this darkness now, and people are starting to see it for what it is. So we're here as abolitionists to try to put an end to these corrupt systems, and many of them George, you know as well as I do, that many of them are compartmentalized, where they really don't care about what happens before or after. They just manage their little area of it, for instance, the prisons. And they turn these into criminal enterprises, literally where you got prison guards who are worth a million dollars giggling to themselves as they walk these aisles for 8 or 12 or $16 an hour. Yeah. In the yeah. meantime, um, they're trafficking. Exactly. We have seen, we have seen them uh, on video having gladiator fights with the prisons, where there are people are betting on them. And I'm pretty sure it's not just people in the prisons betting on these fights. We've also seen them on prison uh, or on video use their power and authority to allow other prisoners to kill prisoners on their behalf. Yes, I've, I've heard said, that too. As Scotty said, anything you can imagine pre-1865 is happening right now in these prisons, and it's not limited to men. It also is just as bad for women and just as bad for children. The Khalif Browder story is an example of what's happening with children, but it's not the extent, the, the full extent. You're just seeing a window. <laughs> Excuse me. The same thing applies to Tutwiler's prison in Alabama, where the women have been saying they've been molested and raped and abused and extorted now for over a decade by the guards themselves, and still nothing has come of that. And those women still exist under that same authoritarian rule by these sociopaths, as you so properly and uh, correctly called them. George, um, do you have you heard about the upcoming uh, march, the move, uh, what is it, millions? for Prisoners' Human Rights March that will be going down in Washington, D.C. on August the 19th of this year. Um, and if you not have not heard about it, uh, you can just Google. Anyone out there listening can Google Millions for Prisoners' Human Rights March. That will take you to the uh, uh, website. It will give you the link to the website so that you can get more information on, about that. Uh, would love to see you out there, George, if you're able to make it. <laughs> I that is that is great to hear. Um, unfortunately, I'm sc- scheduled to speak in Seattle at a at an event called Hemp Fest, and uh, that's going to be August 19th. That that weekend of August 19th. Unfortunately, I'll be on the other side of the country. 
but you know, I'll be well, there in spirit for sure. Well, if you and, could and point it out while you're there, brother, that's what's going on. Yeah, if you could, if uh, you could help us to, you know, spread the awareness about the upcoming march, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. Send me links. I'll I'll do, you know, my my Twitter, Facebook. I'll I'll stay on it for you guys cuz that's important. And yeah, we think you know, it's Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that that um You've you've informed your your listeners uh, uh, about the exploitation of prisoners for profit, whether it's from the companies like uh, Horizon Health, the one I worked for that provided poor medical and and psychiatric help for inmates, or the private prison companies like Geo or Corporation, uh, the Corrections Corporation of America. And then you've, you've no doubt covered how slavery, which is still legal by the 13th Amendment, has allowed hundreds of corporations to take advantage of slave labor in prison. And the point I'm making here is that if there is a group to be exploited, there will be people clamoring mm-hmm. to exploit them. And this is just another case of exploitation. And the end result is people are coming out of prison worse off than, the, than when they went in. And one of the, the things that really gets me steamed is that they pay these prison slave laborers so little money, if any at all, and it's it's counterproductive because let's say for example if we paid them a fair minimum wage some of these workers have children at home they could be paying child support some of these um inmates have to pay restitution to their victims they could pay restitution and for the inmates that could save up a decent amount of money like let's say if they're in for five or ten years they could come out with um, a bankroll to maybe open a business and become productive members of society. So this is something that I advocate for um, within prison reform is that we pay these people a decent wage, you know. And then here's the other thing. Companies that take advantage of prison labor, which is called insourcing, they're at a competitive advantage against the companies that don't take advantage of it or don't know a politician or a prison administrator. So how is that fair market capitalism? You know, if we listen to, we listen to uh, Trump talk about, uh, you know, uh, free this, free trade, all this kind of stuff, this flies in the face of that for sure. Indeed, it does, man. Uh, you know, what I was going to say earlier is that we here believe that, and not only us here at New Abolitionist Radio, but the millions of prisoners who are inside the walls and their spokespeople who have spoken on this and discussed it amongst themselves in depth believe that this moment, by coming together and marching on Washington on behalf of the prisons, prisoners uh, and addressing the 13th Amendment and asking, demanding, for congressional hearings on it. It's something that we've never seen before and that we can all get together uh, no matter what part we play as reformists or uh, people who are trying to help to change or end the system. We can all come together on this, on that one day and make a big difference. The 13th Amendment has never been discussed in the halls of Congress since 1865. It's way past due time for us to bring this to light and to have an opportunity for disclosure where people can see the horrors that are occurring. Because like you, they have no idea until they find out firsthand. So here is our opportunity to show them what's going on. And we believe that this will have effects that will reverberate not only across uh, the United States, but across the world. Because as you and I and everyone else knows, other nations have now incorporated the same system 
to be used to exploit prisoners in their country. Right. And I, I think that the repeal of the 13th Amendment is the first step in this country actually becoming a great country. Because we've had a 400-year uninterrupted relationship with slavery, we cannot call ourselves a great country. We were never a great country by that definition. In my mind, no country can call itself great if it still has legalized slavery as part of its constitution. And I, I cannot move past that. We have great people doing great things. As a country, we've done great things, but we're not a great country. We never have been. Yes, sir. And we can be, as uh, the poem says, America can be America again. It can be great, but it's up to us here in this generation now to do that, to give it that new face lift that it so much needs at this point in time, and to save lives, because while we're talking, people are dying. While we're talking, people are being abused and molested and raped and killed and murdered and brutalized. I just read an article a couple of days ago where another man in Alabama had his throat cut. Can you imagine being in an yeah. Alabama prison right now because you didn't pay a certain fine or a bill, and the guy next to you is getting his coat throat cut, and you're wondering when you're going to be cut next? It's just terrible. Exactly. Every time you walk into a cell, you may not walk out alive, period. You know, um, right. George, you mentioned uh, Donald Trump and his austerity measures, along with the GOP, have been announced, and it's going to cut many popular social programs that millions of people rely on to, because wages are so low, so many people need to have their housing subsidized, their their access to food subsidized, and I don't want to act like it's a handout because all people pay taxes, even poor people pay taxes every time they go to the gas station and get gas, or if they go to a store and purchase any goods, they're paying taxes, so I don't buy into, all oh, these people just want a handout, and plus there's a limitation on how long you can receive assistance uh, thanks to uh, the, uh, uh, what's his name, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich's welfare reform of the 90s. So I don't want to hear that from people. But we we have been analyzing his austerity measures, and I think it was last week where we were saying that, hey, if they cut all of these social programs, they're going to be forcing people to commit, quote, unquote, crimes of survival which will land, land them in prison. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think that they're looking at the consequences of their action. They just have this idea. Uh, this it, Now it's, it's a pretty extreme idea about that. And I think an increase in crime is definitely on the horizon because people need to eat. People need to survive. And, you know, I think that that, could that scenario could definitely play out um, when you cut programs that benefit millions and millions of people? The other consequence is, and and this is a more positive consequence: these people will rise up and vote. We need people to get out there and vote and put people in office that are paying attention to our needs, not the needs of corporate America and billionaires. I mean, this whole idea that he wants to give a tax cut to people who don't need it, cut funding for social programs, increase defense spending. My God, we, we spend more on defense than the next eight countries combined. And we need to increase our funding for that. It's we're living in a twilight zone where it, I, I I'm just shaking my head every week. I can't believe what I'm hearing from uh, Republicans. Um, like for example, just just last week there was that senator from Kansas who was comparing um, Planned Parenthood with Dachau, a concentration camp, and. The, the Jewish people that I know, they, they were horrified. 
And but this is what we're hearing on a weekly basis, and and it and it seems like the Trump administration is a factory of falsehoods. I mean, he accused Obama of wiretapping Trump Tower, and now that's been proven to be ridiculous. And you know, he's he's a pathological liar. I can't trust anything the guy says now. Yeah, like the example where he was just recently telling uh, people in, you know, his speeches that he's doing across the country about how the uh, uh, pipeline that was going through North Dakota over there is going to be using American steel when that whole uh, ideal and lie had been debunked weeks before. Like He never required these people who are building the pipelines to use American steel. It was not part of any deal. They're just going on through. But it sounds good on paper, and it makes the people right. in the crowd cheer you, even right. though it's an outright lie. Um, we have a caller. Uh, yeah. Um, we have another caller. Uh, 757, welcome to New Abolitionist Radio. Uh, give us your name if you choose. Uh, you don't have to, but go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, guy, it's, it's Otis again. Griffin. Greetings, Otis. Hey, Otis, welcome. Yes, man, I'm listening to y'all. I'm telling you, I'll, I'll, I'll be 64 here in July, and I was listening to the man, uh, George. I, as soon as I hear somebody come on, I do my little thing. I, I didn't realize I was following him on Twitter, but I did go back and check over a few things. You ought to be too kind to people when you keep saying that you don't know why they won't do certain things. Uh, this this austerity has been going on in this country for the last 14 or 15 years, we be honest. The idea that Democrats are going to do anything different than what they're allowing the Republicans to do, I just can't wrap my mind around it anymore. I'm watching the streets for the kids. So I'm pretty honest with myself when I look at the way people do. You can't tell me that the billionaires that are in Trump's cabinet don't know about Unicor, GEO, and none of them. They are the prime recipients and the beneficiaries of prison labor. They know. As a matter of fact, let me bring it around to you really simple so you can see I'm not being a uh, conspiracy theorist or something. Do you realize one of the largest retail companies in the world, 130-some years in existence, Sears Roebuck is about to go out of business? And the reason it's about to go out of business is because it didn't participate in slave labor. So it, just as George was saying, it was at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah, I heard and about now, that, Otis, about them closing hundreds of stores. So you imagine this. You can't get a job. You're about to have fourteen to 1,500 retail stores, distribution centers, retail clerks, Families that have been what subsidized and maintained through their through employment through Sears, what do you think is going to happen in the next twelve months when they go under? Right. You're, you're, you're not just. I'm telling you. That's what I'm saying to you. And these billionaires know exactly what they're doing. Well, you know, Otis. Last week we said that we believe that these austerity measures are purposely uh, designed to make the uh, more uh, prison slave labor available. I don't think that's exactly. a, that's a conspiracy I theory. I mean, it's just a logical conclusion by observing what's going on. And, and I tell you, if you think it's not the truth, you hit on something else a couple of mo- uh, weeks ago when you were talking, and I say people don't think things are connected. But I'm telling you, I grew up right in Yorktown, Virginia, and I watched this as I've grown up, and I'm telling you, the things that are happening to me now, I've been on Facebook, which I think is a great medium, and Twitter, and I tell people this, and they think I'm not. At 10 and 11 years old, I listen to older people tell me, this is what's going to happen. You're not all of this great society, and these were un, supposedly uneducated farmers. And I thought that they were lying. And I'm telling you, here I am at 63, when they were battering this in my head at the ages of 10 to 13, and 50 years later, they told the truth. All of this makes sense. I, even the part about uh, arguing about slavery. 
the one reason they talk to me is because as a kid, I used to say it all the time, slavery, you can't have an exceptional cause. I thought that was something, I mean, even in the military, I got in trouble in the military for preaching the same thing. You can't have an exceptional cause and tell me you eliminated something. That's just common sense to me. Now I'm looking at an abolitionist movement going on, and it looks like it's building, but I'm telling you, this system now in America is set up. Even poor people don't want to accept the fact that they're poor. There's 14 to 15 million black people, and out of those 14 to 15 million black people like me, like you, 12 million live below the poverty line, and they don't want to admit it. The fact that you, get, you can get, have an interest card and credit doesn't mean that you're making a livable wage. And I know people are making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year that's just as broke as I am at thirty five thousand. Otis, um, we have to take a station identification break. I want you to hang on because you made a comment about something you heard on uh Black Talk Radio this week. And I agree with your comment, and I'll give you a clue to what I'm talking about when we come back from the other side of the break. Um um, Max, you want to take us to the break, please? Yes, sir. You're listening to New Abolitionist Radio here on Black Talk Radio Network. On the phone, we've got George Mellencroft, author of How to Get Away with Murder or Getting Away with Murder, and uh, Otis Griffin here with Max Parthas and Scotty Reed. We'll be right back after these messages. Okay. Black Talk Radio, since 2008, providing new black media for the masses. And welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. Otis, and, and it's not yes. just the comment that you were um, talking about on social media that you had heard, but we've been I've been seeing it as well, you know, from, from people saying that nobody should be uh, hooked on welfare or living off of welfare or anything like that. But again, no, how can you live off of welfare when there's a five-year limitation total on how many benefits that you can draw? But I, you know, I don't think that there's people actually out there that want to, you know, I, I mean, I have some pride, man. You know, when I first got out the military because of some things uh, financially that my wife at the time had gotten us into, uh, un- unbeknownst to me, because I was over there in the Gulf War. But when I got out, man, I had to go on food stamps. I had two child- two small children. I had a job, but I was only making $11 an hour. And even though the food assistance only came out to $60 a month, we still needed that. And so you had made exactly. you had made the comment that, you know, it's ridiculous for people to say that, oh, you shouldn't be on welfare or anything like that. But again, I put into this system, I get taxed every year. Uh, you know, they take payroll taxes. I mean, take taxes out on me before I even see my check. So I don't see it as them giving us anything. But could you expound on what you were talking about on those sort of attitudes? Oh, yeah. Well, I can say it. I, I think it's very deceptive because you pay into a system that the purpose of government is to undergird people. The the fact that I what I don't understand is how people have allowed the whole purpose of government to be so twisted in their mind until they don't think government is made to help the populace, to help a, a human. They ha- they take pride in knowing that they've got a president who can claim to make uh, get away with paying uh, eighty one million, making eighty one million dollars a year for the last ten years, and they feel that he didn't steal from anybody. This whole history is a theft and deceit and using the system to get over. So how can you tell an everyday person that they should pay the very same taxes, whether it's, I don't care whether it's trash, your county taxes, none of that. If you tell a person pay 10% of, of their home taxes, 
and their income is $35,000 a year. Do you realize that that $35,000 a year, 10% is $3,000? That's a tenth of his income. That's nothing to a millionaire or a multi-billionaire. You can't use so that the whole idea of proportional taxes is crazy. As a matter of fact, I'm going to stop at one thing. If you notice countries that are doing the right thing, Canada is talking about uh, guaranteed income. They're already they already had a program testing that of something like thirteen fourteen hundred dollars a month of a guaranteed income. They already are looking toward the fact that automation is going to make things worse. But what I'm saying to you, our country is getting bad because. They're not even waiting for automation to take in. They're doing it with vulture capitalism. If Sears goes under, that Sears is big. It's almost as big as as Seven uh, Eleven is when it comes to employment. So imagine how many people in the next twelve months are just going to be out on the street if that company goes under. Right. I'll let y'all go from from now. Right. Appreciate it, it. Love the work, man. Love the work you're doing. All right. Thank you, Otis. And again, my whole point right. of asking Otis that question is. Is that, you know, it, it's not all about people making bad choices or they're uninspired, as I've heard some of these talking heads say, or they don't want to work. I'm sure there's a few people like that. And I do know that a lot of millionaires also are defrauding the system by using these social programs. I've seen story after story like like that. But again, I believe these austerity measures have one of their goals, if not the sole goal, but one of their goals or one of the results will be an increase in prison slave labor. The United States already has the largest prison slave labor pool in the world. So that's why I wanted Otis to comment on that because we had that conversation offline, and since he called in, I wanted him to talk about it. Uh, Guys? Well, you know, even Frederick Douglass explained to us how slave owners use food as a weapon of control. <clears throat> so we know that they will use these different austerity measures as a weapon of control. And now I don't tend to get involved in the political structuring of things because I don't see them as Democrats or Republicans and Libertarians. I just see human beings making bad decisions is what I see. And I want to give a shout-out to a friend of mine, Lisa M. Corrigan, who published a book on prison influence. And in this book, she gave us some credit as well, helping her to uh, come to some of her decisions. And not too long ago, she said, she put out an article on how to start a revolution. (laughs) And I was like, no, 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 that's too much details. You only need to do one thing, starve the people. That's all. Starve the people, and you'll have a revolution. And that's what they're doing right now. They're putting people into a position where, as you said, they will resort to crime. Well, sometimes it isn't just crime they'll resort to. They'll start to try to overthrow this system in any way that they can. And we'll end up again, as I noted today, being the anniversary of the passing of the stamp tax, we'll end up with the same situations in hand, a full-scale rebellion. So for me, as I said months ago, watching Trump come into the White House was just the best thing we could have possibly had. Because if he had not taken power, nobody would be looking to make a change on anything. We would have been just as content as we could possibly be with Hillary Clinton and business as usual doing the same exact things that George Malincry has been telling us happened, happened during the Obama administration under Democrats. So we would have been content now we've got a bull in the china shop and he's breaking things and knocking things over perfect so you're just setting the stage for a full-scale rebellion and if i remember correctly it was kennedy that said that those who make peaceful revolution impossible make a violent revolution inevitable that's really good and I'd like to also make a a quick comment on slavery. I think that slavery is an issue that you can't sit on the fence. Either you're pro-freedom or you're pro-slavery. One or the other. There's no in-between. And I've got to tell you, as much as I like Bernie Sanders, he never introduced a bill to repeal the 13th. 
You know, right. where were the Democrats? Where were the progressives? We know the Republicans don't want to repeal slavery. Actually, you Max, had had head, a, Max had a conversation with uh, people from the Sanders campaign about that very thing you just brought up. Now, he was the only one. He didn't introduce it, but he did back the uh, about the what was it? Justice is not for sale act, which would abolish private prisons in this country. But again, that that's like halfway there. You know, the majority of the prison slave labor is in federal and state prisons and not private prisons. So that was only halfway there. Uh, but I would have loved to seen that get passed, and now it's not even in Congress. It's not even being considered anymore. But you're exactly right, George. You know, if if you're not talking about the root of the problem, which is 13th Amendment legalized slavery, then all you're doing is addressing symptoms. So I agree with you, George. Yeah, and he's pointing out just on the moral and ethical level of it, if you know what's happening, and everybody knows now, we see the problems. And you're not choosing the side of freedom. You're not getting neutral ground. You're on the side of slavery. Like, literally, you were ignorant or just saying, I don't care or I don't want to get involved. It means you have chosen to allow slavery to continue. You have crossed that moral boundary. While other people have decided, no, I'm about freedom. So this divides the nation in half. And it gives them the opportunity to make a decision on what side of history you're going to be on right now and you have to make a decision as i said silence is a decision it means you chose to side with the people who are using slavery and human trafficking on the united states citizens as well as pushing their agendas worldwide for other countries to do the same so if you got nothing to say you are just as bad as the slavers you have to speak up and in 1860 when this argument was presented then, it divided the country into two parts, of course, pro-slavery and anti-slavery. Pro-slavery had much of the money and resources. They controlled the narrative. They controlled the media. We're in the same position all over again. And also one of the things that we knew when we started this program was the breakdown of how many people it would take to recreate this instance. At that time, it was 50% were pro-slavery, uh, 45% were anti-slavery, and only 5% of the nation were professed abolitionists. And with that small group and the backing of the anti-slavery crowds, they were able to make major changes happen in this nation. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I like to uh, wrap my, my mind around the phrase pro-freedom. I am pro-freedom. And I think that I don't know if that would get more traction than anti-slavery, uh, you know, but it's, it's like if you're not pro-freedom, you're pro-slavery. That's right. It's one or the other. That's right. And so, and you, have you know, to I was, yeah, yeah. And, and I, even though my emphasis as a psychotherapist is now on, uh, programs of early intervention in our schools and communities to treat mental illness so we keep people uh, from going to prison as a manifestation of their mental illness, I still um, will mention this slavery issue and how it, it creates the, the scenario for exploitation that ends up leaving us all worse off because when – when we have people coming out of prison and they're just going to slide right back into a life of crime, that's, that's not helping anybody. It's not helping the communities they go back to. It's, it's, it's bad every which way you can look at it. George, you know, we've heard, uh, we've sit in or we will listen to the calls of the GO group, the correction corporation, when they do their earning calls and they have a term for what you just described. Repeat customers. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they are exploiting live bodies for profit. They need bodies in prison, and they don't care how they get them in there. So those types of corporations 
they're not in favor of sentencing reform. They're not in favor of mental health funding that would open safety nets in our schools and communities for the mentally ill. They're not in favor of anything that would reduce the prison population. And, and for me, that is just straight out evil. That's just evil in my book. It's the Tucker mobile. It's like the Tucker mobile all over again. You know, when the automobile industry had a chokehold, or still do actually, had a chokehold on the industry, and Tucker came out with that new car that was so advanced and didn't, I think it didn't even use oil in the way that we use it now. And it, it was uh, buried. It was destroyed and buried pretty much. you never seen that Tucker mobile come out. Same thing with the oil industry. Anything that challenges their uh, wealth and resources and power and control is going to be demolished. The oil industry is not just going to walk away today because you found a better source of power. It's just not going to happen. Right, right. And there are so many examples of of that sort of thinking. Uh, Instead of progressive thinking, which is, okay, let's shift to green industries and get away from this death economy. No, there's money in death. There's money in violence. Uh, the problem is when we do violence on other people, we are diminished as people. And these corporations are, uh, in effect, perpetrating violence for profit. I, I, it, it just stuns me when I, when I read about it and I'm like, okay, is anybody paying attention? <laughs> A few. You're right on the money there with with everything that you're saying, George. And uh, we are one accord here on this program with you, brother. And we're glad to know that you're an ally uh, in this fight. And we love to hear your updates on a regular basis of what's going on. Uh, like myself, you're out there lobbying uh, Congress and different people. I think you spoke before uh, Congress in Florida, as a matter of fact, on this issue. And uh, yep. as Kylie mentioned, I, I lobbied the uh, campaign for Bernie Sanders, and on a number of occasions I talked with his campaign manager, his national campaign manager, with his uh, South Carolina campaign manager. The only person I couldn't get actually get to was Bernie Sanders himself. They really kept me away from him. <laughs> and I had threatened at that point, like, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to expose you. <laughs> and I literally did on what was going on with Vermont and the hypocrisy that was coming out of Bernie Sanders' mouth when in Vermont there was only a 1.2 black percent uh, population, 1.2% black population being incarcerated at 14 to 1, and they were still using human trafficking by shipping out prisoners from Vermont to Michigan and how much of the money was going in, uh, in that. You know, so I wrote out the uh, Vermont is Ferguson report and put it right in their hand and said, you were going to listen to me or else, and they listened. And eventually we saw the Justice is Not for Sale Act, and we heard quotes from Bernie Sanders like, it is morally repugnant and a national tragedy that we have privatized prisons all over America. In my view, corporations should not be allowed to make a profit by building more jails and keeping more Americans behind bars. We have got to end the private for-profit prison racket in America. He said racket as in racketeering. Profiting right. off the misery of incarcerated people is immoral, and it is immoral to take campaign contributions from the prison, private prison industry or its lobbyists. And that was him on uh, August 8, 2015. Mm. And he's right. It is well, a racket. And we've shown that people are, are successfully suing parts of this industry for racketeering. Yeah, yeah. It's it's we're we're in a culture of exploitation, and it, it it's showing no signs of letting up. Um, and I think the only way that we're going to change things is to to educate and activate people, because when you get right down to it, it's all coming down to who we put in office. And if we're putting people in office that uh, cater to corporations and and bend over backwards for for uh, uh, CEOs and and billionaires. Well, you know, we're going to get what we vote for, and, and and we're seeing the consequences of that now. 
Yes, we are. And we've seen that many of our politicians are financially tied into these prison corporations. And uh, just to be clear, it's not just the private for-profit prisons that are causing the problem because the state and federal prisons are using the same model as the for-profit private prisons. The for-profit private prisons only show them how to do it much better than they had previously been doing it. So now you have entire states whose primary source of income is prison. Scary. Well, well, Max, there's a few things. Go ahead, Scotty. Yeah, I was just about to say because you know we got mind, body, and spirit coming up at ten o'clock, and we definitely want to get to our regular segments on the Underground Railroad as well as the abolitionists and profile. Did you have uh, some particular stories that you need to get out? Yes, there's two things that I want to uh, make sure that people hear today, if at all possible, on New Abolitionist Radio, uh, for sure. Um, the first thing is a piece of information that I found out about the kids for cash uh, uh, scandal that happened in Pennsylvania. You all remember kids for cash, right? Where two judges were, uh, they pled guilty to literally selling children to a private prison by the name of Merkel that was operating in Pennsylvania. Uh, the judges ended up doing 28 years. The, anybody in the company themselves were never really charged with any criminal acts. They paid an $80 million fine. Well, I found something in there that stood out like a red flag long after the fact now because this happened in 2008. But apparently the brother of the district attorney in this area who was involved with the uh, Pennsylvania facility actually bought that company from Merkel just prior to this case coming out, he brought it in its entirety, brought them out completely, the brother of the district attorney. And this is something that I, I've never seen come out anywhere, this information at all. So I started looking into it a little deeper, and I'll just read one of the quotes here that I found, which is simple public information. It says, building lease controversy. Robert Powell, an attorney and co-owner of PA Child Care, was involved with the leasing of the PA Child Care Building as he was also the County Planning Commission, Commission Solicitor. Powell was only discovered to be involved with PA Child Care in 2002, nine months after the lease proposal had been set. County Minority Commissioner Stephen, uh, Stephen Urban complained that Powell should have fully disclosed his involvement with PA Child Care because of this conflict of interest. And Powell ignored the subsequent and repeated written and verbal notices from county officials to file financial disclosure forms as required by the State Ethics Commission, covering his years of solicitorship employment with the county. As of 2009, Powell had not filed the forms. Now, this is just 2009. This is a year after the PA case. And there was uh, one other part that I want to read here for you in regard to uh, Stephen DePaula Jr., the Alleg uh, Allegheny County District Attorney. It says, PA Child Care is infamous for its involvement in the Kids for Cash scandal. Judges Michael Conahan and Mark Chevarella pleaded guilty to receiving $2.6 in payments from PA Child Care in return for contracting with the facilities and imposing harsh sentences on juvenile defenders, offenders in order to ensure that the detention center would be utilized. In July of 2009, Robert Powell, again, pleaded guilty to failing to report a felony and bring an accessory, uh, and being an accessory to tax evasion conspiracy in connection with $770,000 in kick tax he paid to Chivarella and Conahan. He was the guy who was paying the, the judges in exchange for not facilitating the development of his facilities. Gregory Zappala was not accused of any wrongdoing in the scandal. Zappala's brother, Stephen Zappala Jr., is the Allegheny, Allegheny County District Attorney. So Gregory Zappala bought this facility, and I'll put the links up for people to be able to review. They bought it. He bought it out in its entirety just prior to the scandal. So he owned it at the time, and he was the district attorney's brother. Hmm. I'm just shaking my head. I mean, it's like, how could nobody know that? 
How can nobody, how come it's not in the case? Nobody's talking about it. And he is still the district attorney to this day. That comes from what George was talking about. People and, and district attorneys are elected. You, you know, I don't tell people what to do, but I vote. I don't vote to determine who's going to be the next CEO of USA Inc. Yeah, since I'm in the poll, yeah, I check the box. Or I check the box for the U.S. representative. But more importantly, I'm there to vote for judges in people on the local level because of just what you just said, uh, um, you know, uh, Max, you know, like the sheriff here. Now, I'm, of course, I'm going to criticize them because they participating in modern-day slavery and human trafficking with the drug war and, and all of that, all these people put in uh, jail for victimless crime. But for as long as I've lived in Gaston County, North Carolina, I have never, ever, Heard or seen for myself, because I've been in jail a couple of times. I ain't proud of it, but, yeah, they didn't put me in jail a couple of times, driving no license and all that kind of stuff. But I ain't never heard of anyone being physically assaulted or abused in that manner. And that's because of who's the sheriff running the jail. So, you know, I don't, again, I don't tell people what to do. But that's why I do it. It's because of stories like these on the local level. I, I, I think one of my main reasons for exposing it is to show you how deeply uh, corrupt the entire system can be and how much nepotism can be involved in it. Where not only are they covering up for co-conspirators, but family members now who are, are involved in this and doing it for them. Uh, one final quote I'll read from that whole story is, PA Child Care is a juvenile detention center in Pittston Township, Pennsylvania. It opened in February 2003. Remember that timeline I was showing you? It has a sister company, Western PA Child Care in Butler County, Pennsylvania. Treatment at both facilities is provided by Mid-Atlantic Youth Services, and both were involved in the Kids for Cash scandal in 2008. Gregory Zappala took sole ownership of the company when he purchased Co-robber, co-owner Robert Powell share in June 2008. Now, these are people who were involved in this who have been convicted of crimes. And for some reason, the district attorney's brother can buy this facility outright and do it at a time where a scandal was just about to occur, occur as if he knew it in advance and could get it cheaper. Reminds me of a line from a, yeah, I, I was just going to say that it reminds me of a line from a song, uh, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. <laughs> yes, yes. And there was one other thing that I wanted to expose to people so they understand the, uh, the seriousness and the timeline that we're facing right now. You know, we're asking for an, to amend the amendment, to take the exception clause out of the 13th Amendment and to have congressional hearings. But what many may not be aware of is that Republicans are already moving towards a constitutional convention. When I contacted the NAACP, they impressed upon me how serious they were about not opening up the uh, Constitution for any kind of reinterpretation whatsoever. And because of that, they could not support our efforts in the march. Well, the, the bad news for them is whether they're ready or not, this is going to happen. And I've been doing the research on this to see how far they're involved in it. And I saw that Governor Ab Abbott was one of the main people calling for this constitutional convention. And this is a, uh, a no racist governor, as a matter of fact, who said that women and minorities are just bad people. Uh, he has a friendly relationship with a racist blog writer and white nationalist supremacists. And once I started digging in deeper and deeper, I started finding out who's backing this. It's Alec. Alec is backing this. These, uh, this, this uh, you know, group of businesses, international businesses, as well as national businesses, along with uh, lawmakers who get together in secret and determine what laws will be coming to pass. The, as far as I know, at, in 2015, they had 38 states on board. In 2016, they were only six states away from a constitutional convention. 
and they are planning on making this happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I can tell you it's very close. And if we're not ready, would this 13th Amendment uh, be able to be addressed by that time? Then we only have ourselves to blame thinking that they wouldn't do something like this when they're already doing it. So uh, the people behind these uh, movements are white nationalists and international corporations who, as George pointed out, don't even see us as human beings. I will provide you with some of the videos and links on the new abolitionist page so you can look through them yourself. We're operating on a schedule now. Um, area code 757, I think that's Otis again. Did you have something else to share, Otis? No, I, yeah, I was just going to say when, when Max was talking about the American Legislative Exchange Council, I've yes, been on them for four decades actually started in 1989 when I injured my back and I was in George Bush was the governor of Texas. They are like a shadow government. Everything they do, when you see a bill, when you move, matter of fact, when I first uh, started really following uh, a lot with standing your ground, which guided him and that went on with Trayvon Martin, that's what I kept telling people. That this is an organized group of businessmen that have really taken over government. And when, when you start talking about voting for somebody, the local level is even involved with Alec now. You have to be oh, careful yes. and, and really, really look into the background of every person you talk to when they start talking about running for public office. Because it is a business now. It's no longer about representing the will of the people. Yes, they fly in. They have conferences where they fly in and give classes on how they can go back and sell policies and pass them into law um, on, for, on the state legislative uh, level. So any politician you have a chance to ask a question of, I definitely will ask them, do they have any connections to ALEC? Have you been to any of their conferences? And so on and so forth. Yeah, and I can't call them... I can't Sorry. call her name right away, but there's another lady who actually runs a group that shadows them. I'm gonna, I'll send you a link to her. I'm on on uh, Twitter with her. Jane something is her name. But she's been on them for about 30 years herself. And I'm telling you, if more people wake up to it, we'll stop getting hoodwinked by these people that are nothing but plants. They, most of these people have been trained up. Even even the Paul Ryans and Paul Ryan them come from having worked with Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, all of those people, Paul Ryan and were, were, were uh, brought into that system 25, 30 years ago. This is not this is not just a happenstance that they come together. That That's one of the reasons it was so easy for them when Ted Cruz lost Mercer, who's a, who's a billionaire, when Ted Cruz messed up so, so bad in the primaries, Mercer and four or five other billionaires, including DeVos, switched over money immediately. That's after they had already funded Cruz for up to like 17 to $20 million. They immediately switched over. That's how Paul Manafort became, and, and uh, Kelly Ann Conway came into uh, Trump's uh, uh, candidacy. Trump knew of them, but they literally took over. He's nothing but a figurehead now. There's, there's a, a group of five or six billionaires that basically laid out his cabinet and everything. This is, and that's why I get upset when people talk about what Trump's doing. Trump's not doing this. The billionaires who front him are the ones making the decision. That's why he has so many billionaires in his, in his cabinet. He didn't have those picked out before. He thought he was going to lose until Mercer put the money behind him. I'll send you some links to it, but keep going what you're doing. Well, I think well, Otis uh, makes a really good point about how these politicians are trained. Uh, they, If you listen to Republicans, they all say the same thing. I mean, when it came to down to abolishing Planned Parenthood, the catchphrase is, we're protecting women's health. And it's like every Republican when it came to getting rid of Planned Parenthood, we're protecting women's health. It, it, it's just staggering. And what Democrats and, and liberals and progressives 
artists need to to do is to copy that, but in a positive way, because uh, the democratic message is just so fractured, and there's no cohesiveness. Where the Republicans, they're all saying the same thing, and they they've got a machine in place that's operating behind the scenes. That that Alex Alec uh, deal is. Uh, intense because they get together, the lawmakers get together with attorneys from corporations to write the laws that put more people in prison or to write other laws that benefit corporations. And I, I'm not sure how many people are truly aware of what Alec does in that regard. Yes, the 13th, the film, uh, the documentary 13th, exposed a lot of what Alex is involved with, showing that they even uh, were responsible for authoring the laws during the 1994 Clinton crime bill. And afterwards, like the three-strike laws, for instance, and mandatory minimum sentencing, these were laws that were written by prison companies. <laughs> if you can wrap your head around that. And even at one point uh, on Democracy Now! with Bill Moyers, he called it the United States of Alex, because they literally take control of our nation by taking control of our lawmakers. When we start telling you statistics like one prison company spent nearly $50 million just lobbying Congress in a 10-year period, that should start ringing bells. You should see red flags popping up. When you say $50 million lobbying, you're not talking about, you know, you buying Girl Scout cookies from them, from these uh, congressmen. This is giving them cash rewards, uh, donating to their, their, their campaigns, taking them out to expensive retreats and providing them with anything they could possibly want to the point where even sometimes they just take the cash and put it in their bra, as we've seen recently with certain congresspeople. Yeah, it's bribery, plain and simple. It's bri is bribery. They own our lawmakers. So how the hell can we expect to be a nation of laws built on laws when our lawmakers are owned by prison companies and special interest groups? You know, um, great point. And I was just uh, looking over uh, some news, and you know the um, what's his name, Gorchik, is being um, grilled by Congress right now, or the Senate right now, the Senate confirmation hearings to be the next, um, to take that uh, seat of Anton Scalia. Uh, may he burn in hell. Um, but um, I wonder, and you no, know, I don't wonder, but I bet you nobody's asking him a question about what's his views on the 13th Amendment and whether or not he interprets it as legalizing slavery. Well, you can rest mm. assured that the 13th Amendment is not going to be a conversation, a topic of conversation in the halls of politics unless it is being forced to be a conversation, which is what is our intention, intentions on August 19th, to force this conversation. Out here, we're talking about it all day long. Everywhere you look, people are conversing about the 13th Amendment, even on a global scale. But in the halls of politics, in the House and in the Senate, there was no discussions going on about this whatsoever. And there will not be if left to their own devices for the very simple reason that it opens up a can of worms that may lead to investigations on many congressmen and senators and presidents and their uh, aides and everybody around them that will show that they are in collusion with these prison companies, that their money is coming right from the prison companies, that their campaigns are financed by the prison companies, and that they're retiring very much so on how many people go to prison because of their stocks and investments that are in these prison companies for being hidden and laundered through global uh, investment firms like the Vanguard Group and Pershing LLC. Well, we have... Uh, uh, can I put in? Uh, sh sure. Uh, we got about 10 minutes I'll, left, or maybe 15 minutes, I'll, but... I'll make I'll make this quick, because you brought up Neil Gorsuch, and I tell you, these people are not one-issue candidates. I'm going to read you a quick clip from Democracy Now! about Neil Gorsuch when you start looking into him. 
Neil Gorsuch begins the Supreme Court confirmation hearings, we look at his extreme right-wing political positions as a student at Columbia in 1980. And we speak with his former classmate, Jordan Kushner. While on campus, Gorsuch co-founded the right-wing campus newspaper, The Federalist Paper. The Associated Press report that in Gorsuch's writing, both for the Federalist Paper and the Columbia Daily Spectator, he criticized anti-apartheid protests, saying divestment could hurt the university's endowment. He also criticized racial justice protests and black-led movements on campus while he defended the Reagan administration during the Iran-Contra scandal. That tells you everything you need to know about the next man to sit on the Supreme Court for the next 40 or 50 years. Yeah, they um, they <laughs> really not- they really trying to force uh, our hand, man. They really trying to force our hand, like Max uh, quoted JFK. <laughs> They're making peaceful peaceful change impossible. Um, but we do need to move on to our other segments. Don't want to run out of time as I do have to engineer the next program and need a little time to uh, change out the streams. But I'm going to go ahead and do the max. If you want to get the abolitionist and profile ready, I'll go ahead and highlight the writer of the 21st Century Underground Railroad. Indeed. And I would like to say thank you to both George Mellencott and Otis for sharing their expertise and knowledge here and their passion with our listeners. Thank you always, guys, and uh, please keep us updated on the things as they go along. I will. Thank you. It's great to be on again. Thank you, George. Thank you, Otis. All right. All right. Hey, Scotty. Okay. Um, our uh, our feature tonight of our uh, writer of the 21st Century Underground Railroad is Keith Hayward or Harward. After 33 years of maintaining his innocence, Keith Harward is a free man. The 60-year-old former Navy sailor was wrongfully convicted of a Newport News rape and murder back in 1983. He has been locked up ever since, at one point, facing the death penalty. This week, after DNA evidence exonerated him, the Virginia Supreme Court threw out his conviction. Today, he walked out of prison knowing his name had been cleared. He calls the men who helped convict him criminals. The detectives all through this whole situation tried their best to convince me to admit to something I didn't do. I said I would not do it. I'm not going to admit to something I did not do, said Harward. Harward was convicted using bite mark evidence, a technique some justice advocates call flawed. Chris Fabricant of the Innocence Project said, how many more Mr. Harwards do we have to find before the courts take seriously the obligation to eliminate this unreliable evidence from being used where life and liberty are at stake? Howard has spent much of his adult life incarcerated. He left prison today overwhelmed and joyful, but with one regret, that his parents never saw him cleared of the charges. What hurts the most is the fact that my parents aren't here for this. They knew it. They knew it devastated them. It broke their hearts. So New Abolitionist Radio would like to welcome uh, to freedom Mr. Keith. Harward, welcome to freedom. Welcome to freedom, brother. Uh, I would also add a, a little bit more to that story for you there, Scotty. But apparently uh, the governor out there, Terry McCauley, has signed a bill that will allow people who have been exonerated to receive, uh, the, uh, I guess, money for being incarcerated unjustly. And he's looking to get $1.5 million to this man in particular. You mean reparations for slavery? Um, yeah, I guess that's a close enough word for it right now. Considering it's continuous and ongoing, and even after he leaves prison, he's still going to be suffering. It's hard to even call it reparations. <laughs> but they're paying people with taxpayer money, and this man will be getting 1.5. I would also like to point out that the story said this man one time was facing the death penalty. And we just had George Mallinckrodt on from Florida, and there is a state attorney there 
who is refusing to seek the death penalty. Now, I need some more details on that, but I think that she just doesn't believe in the death penalty. And now you have Scott Walker trying to get her removed because she won't seek the death penalty in this case where the uh, man is accused of killing a slave catcher. And so, you know, again, this just highlights that there are plenty of innocent people on death row and plenty of people have been executed. I mean, you can't bring somebody back. How you going how you going to pay someone after you've executed them for crimes that they did not commit? But instead of Scott Walker down there in Florida going after this state attorney who despite evidence and uh um testimony from people uh, connected to the Daryl Rainey case. Instead of trying to get her removed, he's trying to get the woman, the state attorney removed who won't seek the death penalty. So I just wanted to point that out. Well, thank you, Scotty. That was our 21st century rider of the Underground Railroad. We tried to celebrate their uh, release into, into freedom and let people know just how many of them there are every week, week after week. Our other segment is, if you're ready, Scotty? Yes, sir. The other segment? Okay. Our other segment is our abolitionist in profile, where we remember abolitionists past and present who have contributed greatly to the fight for freedom. This week's abolitionist in profile is the angry abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. And uh, he's one of my favorites, personally, him and Frederick Douglass. I tend to absorb a lot of their information, in particular, even though at points they had very big differences in opinion. Here we go. Prior to the Civil War, and indeed during the war, people continually talked about the abolitionists. Southerners, of course, hated them and made it clear if they caught one, he would be hanged. It is less well known that a majority of people in the North did not like them either. However, it is strange that for all the reference to abolitionists, even students of the Civil War could not name one. Yes, they might say John Brown, however, before the taking takeover of the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, most Americans never heard of John Brown. John Brown was financed by abolitionist money, but was never accepted as a leader. The abolitionist that most people knew in 1860 was William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison was born when Thomas Jefferson was president in 1805 in the Massachusetts seaport town of Newburyport. His father was a seaman who favored strong drink. After one drunken episode, his wife threw his drinking buddies out the house. Garrison's father soon followed, and the family would never see him again. William was only three years old. His mother could not raise the family, and Lloyd was sent to live with the family of the local church deacon. He received a grammar school education. However, young Lloyd grew up lonely and in poverty. At 13, he got a job at a printer's devil for a semi-weekly newspaper. This was a seven-year apprentice program. He also had some success writing articles for the paper. At 20, when his apprenticeship was completed, he decided to start his own newspaper. His newspaper would fight injustice, something he felt had been done to him all his life. The big injustice he saw in the world was slavery. His first newspaper, The Free Press, failed. He worked at a print shop two years before he, he was made editor of a Quaker-owned newspaper, Genius, in slave-owning Baltimore. He wrote a story of terrible conditions on a certain slave ship. The owner went to court and had Lloyd sentenced to six months in jail for slander. Lloyd could have paid the fine instead, as an abolitionist offered him the money, but he refused. Garrison returned to Boston and started the weekly newspaper, The Liberator, for which he is famous. A big event, uh, a big event came in 1831 that would change his life, the Nat Turner slave insurrection in Virginia. Slave owners looking for scapegoats blamed Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, as hatching the slave violence. There is no evidence that Nat Turner ever read Garrison's paper, and the paper was not sold to slaves for the simple reason that slaves could not read. Southern newspapers, however, accused The Liberator of being the evil propagandist behind the uprising. Sales of Garrison's ragtag publication soon tripled. Garrison himself became well-known as the Southern newspapers were making death threats on his life. Far from being intimidated by threats of stabbing, stabbing, poisoning, and abduction, Garrison was delighted. His life as an abolitionist was set. On that undaunted, Garrison flooded both North and South with anti-slavery propaganda. 
a Massachusetts Bible salesman traveling in Tennessee was caught with a copy of the Liberator. He was tied to a post in the public square of Nashville, the home of today's largest prison, uh, private prison ownership, CCA, a.k.a. Core Civic, Nashville, and flogged in 1835. A mob of 3,000 broke into the Charleston, South Carolina post office and seized all abolitionist publications, including the Liberators. Garrison was not safe in Boston either. An angry mob came to an anti-slavery lecture and proceeded to lynch him. He was dragged through the streets, his clothes being torn off. He was finally rescued by the Boston police who took him to jail. The crowd followed and demanded he be turned over to them. The police were finally able to sneak Garrison out of town. Riots followed him and his fellow abolitionists everywhere, New York, Philadelphia, Utica, Albany, and Providence, Rhode Island. He had a strange relationship with Abraham Lincoln. First, he was the only abolitionist to support Lincoln. Second, Lincoln rejected his support as Garrison was in favor of letting the southern states leave the Union. Let them go, he said. Third, when other abolitionists condemned the Emancipation Proclamation, he supported it. One of the great highlights of his life was when his oldest son, George, an officer of the Massachusetts 55th, a black regiment, led the regiment to Charleston, South Carolina in March of 1865, right around this time. William Lloyd Garrison died quietly in 1879. His life was spent convincing Americans that the same chains that bound their slaves would imprison their conscience until they were removed. We here at New Abolitionist Radio salute you, William Lloyd Garrison. Salute. Oof. There you have it, brother. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison. You know, like I said, I take a lot of what he did and a lot of what Douglas did together, and they were at odds with each other, for instance, the emancipation. Uh, but I really was uh, an admirer of the stance that Lord Gar- William Lloyd Garrison took in saying, you know what, we can't live side by side with these sociopathic maniacs. We just can't do it. We can't negotiate with them. We can't live with them. So separation is the best way to go. Let them go. Here, here. Well, we got to do our final comments. I got a couple of minutes so I could change out. I also, if... Uh, the host of uh, Mind, Body, and Spirit are on. I'm going to have to shut down the conference and restart it so it doesn't shut down during your program. Um, one story I forgot to mention, and I am, wow, man, I, I couldn't be happier that Seth Williams, the pencil, the uh, Philadelphia uh, uh, district attorney, has been indicted on corruption charges. This is a man who has argued to keep Mamiya locked up and and deny him parole and what have you. I'm talking about Mamiya Abu-Jamal, revolutionary Black Panther. And so this guy has been corrupted on accepting gifts and bribes and and, and things of that, cutting people deals so uh, they wouldn't face as much prison time and, and trying to fix cases. So please look that up. I was just reminded, Noel, Hammerhand of Prison Radio just shared that. But uh, Seth Williams, if y'all don't know who he is, look him up. He's the Philadelphia DA. He's been indicted for bribery. Bribery. I, I have it on the web page for everybody to see. It was part of my list of uh, collection of stories for this week as well. So I was able to get it really quickly. And you're right. He's completely corrupt. And now his entire uh, career should be examined at this point. Right, right. So my final comments for tonight are, look, these stories should convince you. I mean, we got five years worth of archives of story after story after story after story after story that is showing you that this is slavery. Okay, that like George said, you know, you either for slavery or you against slavery. So like people would say, Hey, if I lived back in slavery times, I would have been this, that, or the other. Well, guess what? We still live in that time period right now. And we are, it's not going to end itself. So if you aren't an abolitionist, then just know you are enemy of the abolitionist movement. Max. Uh, yes, I guess I'll end it with a couple of shout outs. Shout out to Crystal Roundtree. 
Uh, she's doing George Jackson Radio, uh, George Jackson University Radio right now, talking about this very issue. So shout out to her. Uh, I want to give you a mission as a listener. We're at a point where we have a real opportunity to make a difference with the Millions for Prisoners March on Washington. But in order to have that Millions for Prisoners March on Washington, the word millions must be literally filled in. You need millions in the street. That means we have to reach millions. So we need all the help that we can get to get this word out there. Just by my own estimations, if we want to have a million people out there, we need to reach 20 million people through social media, through television, through whatever you can do to get it out there. Somebody like a Jay-Z, for instance, could change the tide of things in a single day with just a few words. And with that being said, I'd like to also give a shout-out to Akeem Browder. I've been in communication with Khalif Browder's brother and family as of late, and they've been sharing the information about the upcoming march. But if somehow, some way, they can incorporate it into what remains of the productions for the Khalif Browder story so people have an option and a way to achieve victory, that would make all the difference in the world. So to the Browder family, if you're hearing me right now, I'm aware that you guys have been following us for quite some time, and I appreciate that. Please talk to these producers and have them incorporate the Millions for Prisoners March on Washington into this production so people can be aware of it. And with that, I'm just going to say this. Abolition is the reason for a revolution so we can finally know some peace. Peace. Rise up, 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 just lift your eyes up, let your wise rise up, see the signs of the times, if it's time, rise up, rise up, when death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up, when famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord's anger is no longer 